It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. He is a person who helps to bring peace on earth, Tom Baker. And there are some new people here today, so I'll tell you just a little bit about him. He's a former Catholic priest, and his spiritual journey brought him into different arenas, different roads, and he's happily married to that lovely lady sitting by him, Kathy Baker. They're a wonderful dynamic duo. Uh, Tom teaches a course in miracles, and he's also a professional counselor, and he has blessed us here for years with his wit and his wisdom. So we look forward to that which is coming through you today, Tom. So let's give him a warm fellowship welcome. Susan, apologize for no vodka today. <laughs> Are you sure? I will be in a minute. <laughs> it's water. <laughs> well, <clears throat> when I was a sophomore in college, I participated in a peace march and got pepper gassed on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in the springtime of 1970. We were demonstrating at the Student Union Center at the University of Kentucky, and there was a fairly large group of students gathering on a little hillside, and I was among them. I was 20 years old with severe ideals. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they were severe. They were like black and white. This is the way the world needed to be, and this is the way things needed to go, and all that. I was a helpless person with a lot of <coughs> control. <laughs> hmm. um, had I thought about it, I was demonstrating to end something that had been a part of civilization from the beginning. Um, we were surrounded by the Kentucky National Guard on three sides with the Student Union building behind us, plus the local police. A soldier with a megaphone warned us that if we didn't leave immediately, we would be gassed. So I adjusted my Navy surplus shirt <laughs> and hiked up my tie-dyed jeans and decided to stand firm. Suddenly a soldier came into the crowd with a machine that looked like a giant hair dryer spewing pepper gas. Pandemonium followed, and half blinded by the gas, I stumbled into the student union building and fell into the policeman who was tearing at his gas mask. I started to struggle to get away, but then realized the officer was himself in distress. It turned out that the National Guard had not properly instructed the police on how to secure their gas masks, and the pepper gas was blinding the police as well as the students. What followed was a scene in which the police and students were helping each other wash the pepper gas out of their eyes at water fountains and from the restrooms. For a moment at least, we laid aside our ideologies to help each other for our distress was the same. War and peace pervades all our life, public and private. War is everywhere. War invades our lives in toys and video games. In the fall, we give over Sundays to the National Football League, which wages war in a game in stadiums across the country with 70 to 90,000 people in those stadiums. When I go to work next week, I will see married couples at war and parents and young people at war with each other. Even in individual counseling, I will see people at war with themselves, something called guilt. Where does this impulse to, to oppose come from? Did God give us this thing? In the Middle Ages, they thought so. It was thought that... Um, there was a war in heaven, and God defeated Satan, and Satan fell to earth. 
And God and Satan have been fighting for people's souls ever since. St. Paul urges us to put on the armor of God. Archangel Michael is often portrayed carrying a sword. The head of religious orders are often called father and mother general. You wonder whether we should cross ourselves or salute. <laughs> When I've taught scripture classes, people love it when Jesus upsets the tax collector's tables and chairs. I once called the deity portrayed in the Old Testament the Clint Eastwood God, and people cheered. <laughs> Make my day, Colonel Jesus. <laughs> Yet Jesus takes up arms against no one. He doesn't even resist arrest or struggle with his captors. The words of war are never on his lips. He even tells Peter, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. In our souls, we are peaceful. Our true selves are pictures of peace. So if we're not naturally warlike, then why so much war? What are we doing wrong? How could we see peace instead of this? Let me talk about the circumstance I know best, and that's marriage. When people are first married, whether for the first or the fifth time, each person wants the other person to help their fantasy of married life come true, or just their fantasies to come true. At the wedding, most couples do not so much love each other as they love their fantasy. That fantasy can come true, but at some point, one spouse usually says to the other, you're not the person I married. You're a stranger to me. At this point, which I call the meeting of strangers, each person has the choice to love or hate the other person just as they are. About a third choose hate, and two people begin a war that ends in divorce. They pass up the opportunity to become friends. Sometimes one spouse starts to treat the other as a stranger, or a spouse starts feeling like a stranger with the other. In any event, with the meeting of strangers, there's a decision to make. The majority of people choose love and friendship, while the minority choose hatred, apathy, or opposition of some kind, and sometimes very subtle opposition, and an enemy is made. Notice I say made. The enemy does not simply appear. The enemy is named, and then war or divorce in this instance is a possibility. The enemy can become a friend if both are willing to see innocence and preciousness in each other. But must, both must lay down the, the temptation to feel like a victim of the other. No one prolongs a war like a victim. To name yourself a victim is to name the other an enemy. In couples, you can see how the enemy is named and how the war is prosecuted. The stranger becomes an enemy and the friendship is lost. I have two examples of people who made peace when they could have made war. The first example is of a woman riding with her husband in the car. They encountered a stopped car ahead of them at a busy intersection. The woman immediately decided that the woman was ahead of them was being obstinate or stubborn and she just wouldn't move. So she yelled at the car to get going. Her husband, angel that he was, <laughs> thought something might be wrong. 
that the woman was in some kind of distress and needed a friendly face to talk to. So he pulled the car around in front of her and got out and went to talk to her. Turned out that she was lost and didn't know where to turn. She was frozen in fear. Her husband was able to orient her to be her friend for a moment and she went on her way. He made peace by seeing that something was wrong, but nothing was wrong with the woman. She was a stranger who for a moment he made a friend. She needed help, not judgment. He brought peace with his understanding. The other example was a woman who was driving to Connecticut with the fear of getting lost. As the fear of getting lost built in her, she decided not to think in terms of fear, but to expect that she was going to meet a friend that she had been waiting to meet all of her life. Sure enough, she got lost. So she drove into a fast food restaurant and saw a man mopping the floor. She went up to him and asked him, where she was. Again, in a few sentences, he set her straight, and she was on her way to where she was going. The woman, called her Sharon, made a choice between fear and love, and then pictured a friend helping her. Sharon decided against fear and decided for love. When we decide for fear, we go to war both in our lives and in the world. When we decide for love, we find peace and are no longer lost. In the book God Calling, Jesus calls himself the great friend. He doesn't mind if you want to stay a stranger to him, but if you allow him, he will be your great friend and can help you through your struggles. Jesus is the prototype of the stranger and how we're to see the stranger. See me in the least of your brothers and sisters. That would be those strangers who could become enemies. See in them the Christ and all the world is your friend and all the world is at peace.